All right, fellow DCS Phantom Flyers, we're gonna cover the fuel system today because there are some things you need to know about the fuel system before you take to the virtual skies in this baby. All right, and welcome back everybody. And we are going to cover the fuel system in depth. And this is kind of important in the Phantom because you as the pilot have to manage the fuel systems. I mean, some of it is automated, but a lot of it isn't as far as uh, transferring a fuel from either your wing or your external tanks if you're carrying them. All right, there are three main locations of fuel in the Phantom. You have the fuselage tanks, you have the internal wing tanks, and you have optionally the ability to carry external tanks. All right, so let's take a closer look at the fuselage tanks. Uh, these are divided into individual cells and they're numbered from front to back cell one through cell seven. Uh, unique to the E is the seventh fuel cell, which was installed to counterbalance the additional weight of the M61 Vulcan uh, 20 millimeter cannon that was installed in the nose. All right, so cell one is a very important tank. This is also known as the feed tank, as this is the tank that holds the boost pumps that feeds fuel down to each engine. Now, cell two right behind it is piped directly into cell one, and it feeds its fuel by gravity into cell one. Uh, moving back, we have cells three and four. Three feeds into four. Four has transfer pumps that feed fuel into cells one and two. Uh, same thing with cells five and six here. Uh, five feeds into six. Six holds a pair of transfer pumps that, that move fuel forward also into cells one and two. Now the pumps that are in cells four and six, you have an electric pump in each tank and you have a hydraulically driven pump in each tank. The electric pumps are the primary and the hydraulic ones are a backup. If you have a total electrical failure in the jet, the hydraulic pumps will take over and, and continue moving fuel forward into cell one to keep the engines uh, running. The, they will also work together with the electric pumps in high demand cases like when you're running full afterburner. Alrighty, here we are in a cockpit and now let's go over all of the fuel instrumentation and the controls. Alright, so first up is the most important gauge. This is your fuel gauge. This is the only fuel gauge in the entire aircraft as far as the pilot and WISO is concerned. Uh, and unlike the F-14 Tomcat, the WISO in the backseat does not even get a fuel totalizer. This is the instrument. So if you're flying multi-crew, that is something you need to coordinate between both seats as to your fuel profile, your fuel consumption, and uh, fuel planning. All right, so the gauge is broken down into two parts. Uh, the bottom half, as you can see, is the fuel totalizer. And right now it's reading 0532. There should be an extra zero at the end, and it's you can see that right above it says fuel pounds times 10. So you have to multiply this number by 10 or simply add an extra zero to this. So right now it's indicating that I have 5,300 pounds of fuel on board. That's total. Uh, the upper half of the gauge, you see, it looks like an arc with a tape that is currently at a little over 5,000 pounds and this is where you see that pounds times a thousand this is the this is the fuel tape part of the gauge so the tape is measuring the fuel in the fuselage cells only and only cells one through six are on that indication cell seven does not count on this at all totalizer and the fuel tape are matching this is what I'm expecting when I'm this low of fuel because all of the all of the fuel from the wing tanks by this point has transferred up to the fuselage tanks. Now the wing tanks will only transfer whenever you are in the air. It does not do that on the ground at all. Alright, so moving on to other instrumentation. Immediately below we have the fuel flow gauges for each engine. And that's measured in pounds per hour on each engine. Now an important thing to note the afterburner is uh, the afterburner's fuel consumption does not show on this gauge at all. This is only the fuel going into the engine core and not the afterburner. 
the J79s use a different set of pumps and a afterburner fuel controller for the afterburner specifically. And like I said, that fuel flow to the afterburner does not show on this gauge whatsoever. And if I can demonstrate that now, here I am, 100% military power. And if I throttle up the afterburner, you can see my core temp rise, you hear the afterburner. Fuel flow gauge did not significantly increase, but look at my fuel totalizer, and you can see that thing is just dropping as fast as it can to zero. It, those J79s are thirsty, but man, are they strong. Come out of burner. You can see the fuel flow move accordingly. All right, so that's the fuel flow. Now, I want to move my head, and I'm going to put the arrow on the screen. You guys can see this one lonely switch right above the tail hook handle. That is the feed tank check switch, and it is spring-loaded to the down normal position. Uh, if you click and hold that up and look at your fuel gauge, you should see this number. Both the fuel tape and the totalizer are showing you what is in cell number one, the feed tank. This lets you know that it is indeed full. Uh, that tank does hold about 1,350 pounds of fuel. So that is a normal indication on this. If it is lower than that, that could indicate that you have a feed problem with the other tanks or you have um, you are consuming way too much fuel with the afterburner, which the transfer pumps in the other tank do keep up pretty well. So that is worth noting. All right. Now, down on the telelight panel, also we can call this the master caution and warning panel, you have a couple of tanks, uh, a couple of status lights for your external fuel tanks. And they are lit up in green right now. These three lights will tell you that there is no flow coming from the external tanks. That's your indications for fuel transfer back and forth from your um, from your external tanks. All right, over on the left-hand console behind the throttles and on the outboard side, we have this control panel for the fuel system. We have the dump switch, and that will dump the fuel that's in the wing tanks. We have the internal wing transfer uh, stop switch. It normally is in the normal position. The stop transfer only applies if, let's say, you have one wing tank feeding up, but not the other, like you got a stuck valve. I don't know if that is modeled. I haven't seen that in the jet. But uh, if, you're, if you've flown the P-51 and you know if you don't balance the fuel in the tanks, you notice that the, the wing one wing will get heavier than the other and you'll just start banking on its own. But that that stop transfer will stop the transfer of fuel from your internal wing tanks. All right, that guarded switch right here, this is how you can deselect the external tanks from getting refueled when you're doing mid-air refueling. Its normal position is all tanks. There's your air refuel switch. That opens the air refuel door on top of the fuselage. The triangle switch is an important one if you are carrying external tanks. And if we look outside, I'm in active plus so that explains the smoke plume right behind me. We have all three of the tanks. And I'll show you this open the air refuel door and it pops out of the top of the fuselage there. All right, we come back to our fuel panel. And lastly, we have the boost pump check switches. Those have All right, now as far as the boost pump check switches goes, this is a ground of This is only something that you can do on the ground and only with ground power. All right, so let's let's check that out. So let's call up the crew chief. 
You can and you can do the gesture wheel with either the mouse or your head. So external power and connect it. Alright, he should have the plug connected. Hey, we got our helmet right there on the canopy rail. Alright, so now we switch on our external power. See the cockpit coming to life? That's good. Alright, so to check the boost pumps, uh, you want to make sure that your engine master switches are not on. This is the only, because uh, if you turn those on, the boost pumps will activate on their own and you won't get a good reading. So, we're on good ground power. Let's check the left boost pump pressure. And we see that the boost pump pressure came up. So that boost pump is working. Check the right. Right one came up. That's looking good too. Excellent. Those have no functions in flight because when your engines are running, your boost pumps are running. And those pressure gauges for your boost pumps are right there on your um, left vertical panel. Alright, so that triangle switch, this is how we activate our external fuel tanks. And the up position is for our wing tanks, the down position is for the center tank, uh, middle position, it's a three position switch, the middle position is off. When this switch is in either external position the transfer valves for the internal wing tanks stop and the fuel is now coming from your external tanks direct to the fuselage tanks. So if you're not mindful of this, this can lead to a situation where you have trapped fuel. Where your fuel totalizer will be showing fuel in the wings, but if you leave this switch set to an empty tank, that fuel is going to stay in the wings because it will not transfer up. But since I have the tanks on here, let's see. Let's observe what happens on the fuel fuel gauge whenever I activate one of. The, let's, let's open the center tank, and the fuel totalizer starts increasing. This is a big note right here. The external tanks do not add to the fuel totalizer. The, the F4 had very simplistic tanks in that they did not have any instrumentation inside them to indicate the fuel quantity up to the jet. They have a float switch, so whenever you're doing mid-air refueling, the lights up here uh, on the canopy boat will light whenever they're full. And I think... Nope, they don't. Alright, so I let the fuel burn down and transfer up. Now, I want you to observe, we have our center tank selected. The center external fuel light is lit. And our fuselage tanks are not full. Remember, anytime you're sending fuel from the externals, it goes straight to the fuselage tanks. It does not go to the wing tanks first. So, our center external fuel light is lit and our fuselage tanks are not full. That is a very strong indication that that particular external tank is now empty. So we can confirm this since we're carrying the other two. Let's go ahead and select the external wing tanks. And now we're getting transfer up into the fuselage tanks. How's our fuel state? Hey, Jester. You're good. And that's that's a neat little feature with Jester. Now he will he will periodically check on the fuel level. All right, what I'm watching for here is watch what happens whenever the fuselage tanks reach their full point, which sometimes indicates right around 7,300 pounds, maybe a little higher. Right there, 7,380. Notice how it stopped counting up 
and now we have two external fuel lights this is normal so the at the transfer valves built into either the wing tank stations or the center fuel station if they don't sense any flow that's when you get the fuel lights this is normal because now the fuselage tank is full and there's no more room for any additional fuel now the the external wing tanks still have fuel and we can verify this because the the internal t the fuselage tanks are indeed full now those lights it's normal for them to come on and off periodically to keep the tanks uh, the fuselage tanks full it's whenever they stay on for an extended duration and you see that your fuselage tank is not at around 7300 7400 pounds that is a strong indication that those external tanks are indeed empty all right so that's enough about external fuel tanks let's observe what happens whenever you get into a fuel critical situation all right here we are in another jet so we do not have any external tanks on board no external fuel tanks are selected and if we look at our fuel totalizer the total matches the fuselage tank so we know there's no more fuel remaining in the wing tanks and we are totally on our own as far as fuselage fuel now around 2300 pounds of total fuel remaining the automatic fuel transfer system will engage so let, I'll engage burner speed this process along so the McDonnell Douglas did account for the possibility that trap fuel would exist if a pilot forgot to manage his external tanks effectively and if the fuel level within cells one and two falls below 2300 pounds what's going to happen is the automatic fuel transfer system will engage and it will force open all transfer valves for all external tanks and all the wing tanks and you'll see that there it is so those three lights just activated to let you know that hey the transfer system just engaged you're now in the near fuel critical state it's trying to get every possible tank that may have trap fuel to transfer up to the fuselage tank to keep your jet airborne all right now when this when the automatic fuel transfer system does engage what will happen is all of your controls on the fuel control panel are locked out because the automatic system just kicked open every single transfer valve now notice what just happened there are fuel level low light the red light just lit telling us that we are in a fuel critical situation and that also lit the master caution light and will also light the master caution light in the back seat so the the external tank transfer lights does not light the master caution light but most of the lights on this panel will light the master caution just as it did now if we get into this state and the automatic fuel transfer system kicks in, how does it get reset? Well, you have to hit the tanker and get fuel on board and cycling the air refuel switch will reset the system back to normal as long as you have enough fuel on board, say over 3,000 pounds at least. You wanna get it above the, uh, you want to get the fuel level in your tanks above where the automatic fuel transfer system kicks in. Alright guys, we are back in the jet that had the external tanks. And remember when I mentioned earlier that the centerline tank has a limitation built into it? Well, if we look here on our weapons panel, we notice that we have a light lit that says CLTK. That is telling you that you have a centerline tank loaded. The centerline tank, uh, when it's mounted, 
will interlock the forward two sparrows from being launched because the rocket exhaust could either uh, torch the tank or if you have uh, sometimes a bomb rack can light this light to let you know that you have stores loaded in that position and you are not able to use the forward two sparrows in this instance. All right, Diesel, you say, well, how do we fix this? Well, in order to clear that, you have to get rid of the store. So to do that, this is very similar to the Hornet, if you guys are familiar with the Hornet. So we have to select the appropriate stations on our station select panel. We come down here to the jettison knob, and right now it's off. And again, this is very quite similar to the Hornet, if you guys are used to that. If we look underneath, the bottom position is stores. So we need to rotate this knob down to the stores position. And it's, it, I have track IR, and it's still a little tough to see. So we want it in stores. We have our store station selected, and now we just hit push to jettison. And now they're gone. You notice that the tank light went out, so now we are able to use the forward two sparrows. And again, just to reiterate, this is why in real life that the centerline tank was not carried very often is because of that limitation right there. Plus, uh, the drag that it imposes, it didn't get you any more benefit than just carrying the two wing tanks. Alrighty, our next stop is aerial refueling. Everybody's favorite thing to do in DCS. For quite sarcastic in this. This is this is a difficult activity at best, but it is important in the Phantom, just like it is in the F-16, because both of these jets are quite thirsty. This one in particular. All right, so let's go ahead and call the tanker. All right. So some tips I want to pass along as far as refueling goes. Uh, one of them is uh, you would probably want to bring your seat down to a low position. Which on the ejection seat is this switch over here on the right hand side of the seat. Pardon my flying because I'm trying to explain things at the same time. So, and then you want to open your air refuel door like so. Now you're going to get a ready light on the upper part of your canopy bow indicating that your system is ready. And this isn't a full on tutorial on how to refuel the Phantom, but this is just some of the highlights for doing this. And, you, and trim is your friend when it comes to this. And as you take on fuel, your center of gravity is going to move aft, so you're going to want to trim nose down periodically just to counter that effect. All right. Ready, Slow and steady wins the day when it comes to tanking, and a lot of patience. So whenever the tanker connects, you're gonna the ready light will go out and indicating that you are taking fuel. Go ten feet forward. That is a nice addition that Heepler did was uh, just for callouts for getting talking you into position. Go forward seven feet. Yes, sir. Forward four feet. That's it, the fuel's coming. There we go. And I can see forward. Whoa, uh, whoa, whoa, you're charging the boom. So that means I'm I'm going too far forward. You're drifting up. Now I'm going to intentionally come off to show you guys what happens. 
So you're gonna get a disengaged light on the canopy bow whenever this happens. Hey, you're about to fall off. Hey, you're drifting at. There's the disengaged light. Now, in order to take fuel again, you have to reset the system. So you have to cycle the air refuel switch again in order to reset the system back to ready. So off, on, back to ready. You have to do this every time you fall out, you come off of the boom if you didn't take a full load of fuel. And keep trying again. This will take some practice, I'm not gonna lie. This, it, it's, it's challenging but rewarding and especially if you're trying to do like deep strike style missions, this is going to be a critical skill uh, as far as that. Cause like I said, this thing is, uh, the F4 is, can be a thirsty jet and especially if you're liking to light those burners. All right, everybody. Hope you guys learned more about the fuel system. It does have some, it does have some nuance to it. This jet is just a lot of character and it has a lot to learn. There's hardly any automation that helps you. So I like to approach this just like my Warbird guides uh, that I do is provide a solid foundation of the underlying systems of the airplane that that way you have a solid foundation of knowledge to build off of and I hope this helps especially with the fuel system now coming up I will also be doing the electrical system and also the hydraulic and pneumatic systems as well so I hope to I hope you guys enjoyed this and learned from it I will see you all very soon with a couple more of the guides for this wonderful aircraft so Thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.